Hello everyone, this is Mike Dowding with the SD Mines Physics Department and this is the first of a number of online video lectures that we're going to be using to continue with Physics 213. Uh, just before spring break all of our course sections should have finished up chapter 25 which covered capacitance so today we're going to start with chapter 26, which covers resistance and resistivity. And for this video, along with future videos, I'm going to be using a combination of OneNote and some screen capture software. And then I will upload these videos to Wiley Plus so that you can watch them at your leisure, come back and watch them for review and we'll see just how long we need to make these videos hopefully it's just for the next two weeks or so and then we can get back to our face-to-face -face meetings in class however if it does become necessary we can finish out the semester using these videos without too much trouble i believe so with that we'll go ahead and get into the next topic for chapter 26 which is resistivity now the chapter itself talks about two things we have resistivity and resistance and even though the two sound pretty similar there is a difference between the two terms typically whenever we're talking about some kind of a circuit element or some kind of uh, component to a circuit board we're talking about the resistance of that object however when it comes to resistivity what we're really talking about is the material that the object is made out of so resistivity this is actually a material property and what resistivity is going to do is it's going to tell us how much that material resists the flow of charge. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a material. So right here we'll have a cylindrical section of wire. And that wire will have a certain radius R, we have a certain length of L, and it's worth mentioning that um, this uh, conductive material. So we have to have we have to have a conductor in order for charge to pass through it. But this conducting material can really be any shape. I'm just I'm just choosing something that has a an easy enough geometry for us to deal with um, for this introductory discussion. But we have this conducting material, it's a cylinder, you can see its, um, its dimensions, radius and length, and what we want is to have some kind of charge passing through the material. So in this case we'll say a positive charge wants to pass through this material. Now, how easy is it going to be for that charge to travel through this material? And I'm going to go ahead and switch back to, to red here. And keep in mind that any material out there is going to be made up of some construct of atoms. And given the types of elements, along with uh, the consideration of things like um, impurities or vacancies so there there could be other elements sort of scattered throughout this material um, so those, those would be considered impurities uh, we could also have like little cavities in there um, so those, those cavities could also be considered impurities. But for right now, 
we want to consider a material that is as pure as we could possibly get it because the resistivity of the material um, it works better if you're working with pure materials now pure materials those can get a little expensive so there are going to be composite materials out there that have a certain percentage purity to them and based on that purity they will either conduct or resist charge at different levels but for right now let's just say we have this pure material and all of these atoms which I've drawn in red here they're all connected together through their chemical bonds and so we we have this crystal lattice for lack of a better term and when our charge is trying to travel through this material well it doesn't always have the easiest of times because as our charge gets closer and closer to one of these atoms we have to keep in mind that surrounding every one of these atoms is a cloud of electrons and it is those electrons that are helping to form the bonds that hold this structure together so our charge is not going to have the easiest of times trying to travel through this construct our charge is going to be attracted and repelled by different forces and it's basically going to bounce around throughout the material kind of like a game of pinball until it finally emerges on the other side and it's this ability for the material to resist the flow of charge that we call resistivity and every every material out there has its own unique structure and so every material is going to have its own unique resistivity and we are going to denote resistivity using rho and we'll we'll actually come back and we'll talk about the the units of resistivity here in a little bit because now what we want to do is discuss what resistance is so resistance is going to be a property of the component itself so far we've only talked about the material we haven't yet brought in the geometry and so now we need to talk about the geometry and how that is going to affect the ability for charge to move through our conductor but since we're talking about charge let's go ahead and update this because we're not just going to have one charge moving through this conductor we're going to have multiple charges moving through the conductor followed by more charges and more charges and more charges in fact we're going to have a current of charged particles flowing through our conductor and so current also known as electrical current is going to be the flow of these charged particles now our charged particles we're using Q to represent individual charges we're going to use the letter I to denote electric current and the way we measure this electric current is we want to know how much charge per unit time is traveling through this conductor so our current will be charge per unit time which we can also 
shrink that expression down to an infinitesimal ratio. So if we have a, a changing rate of charge, we can compare that to the changing rate of time, and that gives us our instantaneous current. Well, so now we've got current. Why is current traveling from one side of the conductor to another? Well, the same question could be asked as why does a single charge move from one side of the conductor to another? And the answer to that question is that there is a potential difference that has to exist across that material. Where are we going to get that potential difference? Well, that's going to come from a battery. And we've seen batteries used in the previous chapter. The symbol that we're using for the battery looks like this, where we have one large plate and one small plate. The top plate indicates the positive connection. The smaller plate indicates the negative connection. And our material, so this uh, conducting cylinder here, and my picture is starting to get kind of messy, so I'm going to bring everything down here. Remember, we can have just about any kind of shape or construct that we want, and as long as it's conductive, then we can assign a resistance. Got my N in there, resistance, which is going to be denoted by R. And our resistor will look like this sort of zigzag shape. So our cylinder, we want to figure out well, if I connect this cylinder to a battery, well, there's the potential difference that I needed. The positive negative node of the battery is going to tell us which charge we have flowing in a given direction. And it's at this point that we'll go ahead and define the direction of charge flow. Uh, many, many, many years ago, in fact, a couple hundred years ago, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the the first individuals to do some really groundbreaking work with electricity found out that whenever he set up a battery system that there would be this flow of charge he just didn't know if it was positive charge or negative charge that was flowing through the systems they didn't have the equipment necessary to measure those kind of things all he knew for sure was that there was charge flowing and just to keep the math easy he said well let's just make it the positive flow of charge. So for all of our discussions starting now and continuing for the rest of the semester, electric current is going to be the flow of positive charge. Even though we know that in all of our electric infrastructure we actually have electrons as the particles that are flowing and those are negatively charged but for now we're going to go with the traditional sense of current being the flow of positive charge all right so i have a potential difference of v which is coming from the battery that potential difference is now noticed between the two ends of the conducting material and we get this current of I passing through the material. Now why do I get the amount of current that I do passing through that conducting material? What determines how much charge flows through and how fast that charge flows through. Well, that's going to be determined by 
first of all, the resistivity of the material. So whatever this cylinder was made of, it could have been made of copper, gold, silver. There's, you know, a whole list of either pure materials or composite materials that can be used as conductors. And every one of those is going to have their own specific resistivity value. And so the first thing that we notice is that the resistance of our cylinder is first of all going to depend on what it's made of and that's the resistivity. The next thing that we have to consider we'll go back to black here so the next thing we have to consider remember that this cylinder has all of these atoms inside there and it's the the layout of those atoms that tells us basically what the resistivity is but now we consider the chore of having to get one of these charges through this conducting material so what I'd like you to do is consider that you're walking down a hallway and you're the charge and you need to get from one end of the hallway to the other end of the hallway and every one of these atoms inside of the conductor is another person that you could potentially bump into the question is how likely is it that you're going to bump into somebody as you're walking down this hallway and your first response to that might be well I guess it depends on how densely packed the hallway is how many people there are and I would agree but that goes back to the idea of resistivity what if I were to take the same density of people but make the hallway shorter so what would be the likelihood of you bumping into somebody if you had a shorter hallway to walk down and the answer would be much less so as it turns out the length of the material that we're using can have an effect on the resistance that we run into the longer the material the greater the chance that we're going to have some kind of interaction or hindrance along the way the shorter mater the material the less likely that we're going to have some kind of interference as we're trying to pass through <clears throat> so there is a direct proportionality between the resistance that we experience and the length of the material okay well the length of the material that played into one of the two parts of the geometry of the object so if the length of the material is going to have some kind of a, an effect on the resistance to the flow of charge uh, what's the what's the radius going to do if anything so we'll come back down to our little discussion here and we'll we'll still stick with the the analogy that you're trying to walk down a hallway but instead of making the hallway longer or shorter let's try making the hallway wider and I'll, com I'll compare this to this one right here so 
material. One is approximately the same length as material two. Or maybe I shouldn't call them materials. I'll call them object one and object two. Because they should be made of the same material. So I want to have roughly the same density of atoms distributed through this material. And you probably say to yourself, well, if it's just as long as object one was, then I should probably have the same chance of running into something until I finally make it through. And I would agree. However, by making the cross-sectional area of our conductor larger, we allow for the opportunity that more charges can enter the material at once versus over here on this side where having a smaller cross-sectional area doesn't allow for as many charges to pass through at the same time. And so having a larger cross-sectional area means that we can actually pass more charges through at a higher rate. And so that cross-sectional area, which will be related to the radius of the cylinder, but as I said before, we don't have to have a cylinder. Um, we can have any shape, and the area, or the cross-sectional area of that shape, that is what's going to be important. And so what we have here is an equation for the resistance of this cylinder. It's made up of uh, two main considerations. We have the materials property, which is the resistivity. And then we have the geometry of the object, which is this combination of length and cross-sectional area. Well, now we want to figure out what are, what are the units. Well, we already done the, the, the units of length. Those are going to be meters. The units of area, that'll be meters squared. Uh, we still need to talk about the units of resistivity. But resistance, we can actually do that right now because there is a means in which we can measure the resistivity of an object using a ratio of potential to current. If you remember back in chapter 25, we were able to measure the capacitance of a capacitor as the ratio of charge to potential. Well, now we have a ratio expression that tells us what resistance is going to be. And we already know what the units of potential and current should be. Potential has units of volts, and current will have units of coulombs per second, which for those of you that have taken circuits know we're also going to measure current in amps. So resistance can be measured as a volt per amp, but likewise most of you probably know already that resistance is going to be measured in ohms. And for that, we use the Greek letter of omega, which looks like a horseshoe. So we're going to bring all that information down here. We're going to say, well, 
our resistance is measured in ohms. We have length in meters, area in meters squared. So what does that leave us for resistivity? Well, let's find out. We have meters over meters squared. Sorry, that should have been ohms. So what are the units of resistivity? Well, let's just bring everything over to the other side. Uh, meters and meters squared are going to reduce, and we will have, it looks like, ohm meters are the units for resistivity. So what does all of this do for us? Well, this allows us to take pretty much any kind of construct or any kind of capacitor, I'm sorry, not capacitor, conductor. And if we know the geometry and the material's property, then we can tell how much resistance this object is going to pose when we hook it up to a battery. In other words, if we take our ratio expression for resistance and rearrange it, we get a pretty famous expression in circuits, which is called Ohm's Law. V equals IR. In other words, if I apply a potential to a resistor, I will get a certain amount of current to flow through that resistor. So it's this current that we will then see start to flow through that conductor as a result of hooking it up to the battery. Now for those of you that have been in my lecture, you have heard me refer to a capacitor and I'm going to take the, the parallel plate capacitor as an example. This is the equation that tells us what the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor will be. And just like our discussion with the resistor, our capacitor depends on two main considerations. What it's made of and what its geometry is. And so this is what I call the store-bought value of the capacitor. In other words, you make the capacitor, the geometry is fixed, the materials property is fixed, and so this value is not going to change. Likewise, for the resistor, everything that we have here is either materials property or geometry. So when I build this resistor, as long as the geometry and the materials property remain unchanged, then the resistance of that resistor should remain unchanged. So this is what I will call our store-bought version of the resistor. Time for an example. All right. Let's take a cylindrical segment of wire, which is two meters long, has a radius of 0.1 centimeters. So there's our radius. We have our length. Obviously this is not to scale. And we'll say that this wire is made out of copper. So what we're going to have to do is look up the resistivity for copper.
so resistivity of copper. And you can look up on Wiley Plus in the read study practice section, there is a table that has a handful of common resistivity values. We want the resistivity of copper. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my phone and ask my phone what the resistivity of copper is. Resistivity of copper. And there we have it. That is 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8. And remember we said that the units were ohm meters. Well, I now have everything that I need to figure out the resistance of this wire. All I have to do is plug everything in using my store-bought equation. 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8. We have a length of 2 meters and well now I need to plug in the area. I don't have the area yet. I have the, the radius but I need to figure out what is the cross-sectional area of this cylinder. Well, it's a, it's a cylinder, so that means I've got a circular cross-section, which means the area is going to be pi r squared. And we have to be careful here because even though I didn't write this down, I said that this was 0.1 centimeters or 0.1 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. We need to be absolutely certain about our values here, especially since we're going to be uh, squaring this. So now we get out our trusty calculator to help us with our calculations. And assuming I'm doing everything correctly, I am getting a cross-sectional area that is equal to 3.142 times 10. Let me recount that. To the negative 6 square meters. And so that value is going to go into the denominator here for the cross-sectional area. And we will calculate what the resistance of this object is going to be. And I am getting 0 0.01 ohms. So not a whole lot. But given that this is a wire and we want it to conduct electricity, we want it to carry charges, we shouldn't expect a very large resistance. Whereas if you have some kind of insulating material, in the case of an insulating material, you would expect a tremendously large resistance because you want an insulator to resist the flow of charge. Okay, well, let's take our cylinder here, or as we said, two meter wire made of copper, and let's plug it into a battery. Let's say you find yourself a 12 volt battery and you want to plug this wire into that battery. So what's the current through that wire going to be? Well, Ohm's law is waiting to be used. We just need to rearrange it to solve for current. 
We have a 12 volt battery. And we have a resistivity of 0.01, which is going to give us 1200 amps. And if that sounds large to you, it is. Uh, but keep in mind that this wire has a very, very low resistance value. And so if we were to hook this wire up to a battery, having such a low resistance would mean that the charge would just start screaming right through that material so that it could get to the opposite side of the battery. So having that much amperage run through, that's probably going to be a, a bit of a problem. In fact, it's probably going to be pretty dangerous. Uh, but this is why in most circuits you usually have much larger resistance values. Um, that's, bas that's basically how you're going to keep the current under control in a lot of your circuits is to incorporate larger values of resistors along the way. All right, well now we know what resistance is. We know that it depends on resistivity. And as I said, this is going to be a, a store-bought value, and so it shouldn't change. Except I kind of lied. There is a way that we can change the resistance of a resistor. And looking at this equation, you might think to yourself, well, um, you know, maybe we could reshape the wire. Maybe we could grab a hammer, pound it out, reshape it, make the wire longer, make the cross-sectional area smaller, and all of, all of those are, are valid ways of doing that. But what about changing the resistivity of the material itself? And what I am alluding to is what happens when your resistor gets hot. Because these resistors, we have current running through our object, but as these charges are moving through the material, keep in mind that they're interacting and colliding and bumping around with all of the other atoms that are inside the material, and that's going to start generating some friction, that's going to start generating some heat, and that's going to make the temperature go up. So will the temperature affect the resistance of our wire? And the answer is absolutely. Because when this wire gets hot, what do all those little atoms inside the wire start doing? And until now, we really haven't we really haven't uh, talked about the the dynamics of the structure inside the material, uh, and we're not going to. But one thing that we do need to keep in mind is that there is some amount of internal energy inside this object or inside this material. These individual atoms, they're not just sitting still. They all have a little bit of energy associated with them. They're kind of vibrating, bouncing around back and forth. And this internal vibrational energy, well, they're moving. So there's a certain amount of kinetic energy associated with each one of these atoms. And so what we do is we take a measure of the average kinetic energy and we call that temperature. 
So now consider what happens when we bring a charge through here and that charge is traveling with a very high velocity and it starts colliding with all of these atoms along the way transferring quite a bit of its kinetic energy to the conducting material. In other words, the charges themselves actually cause the average kinetic energy of our conductor to go up. These charges cause the material to start vibrating at a faster and faster rate. And so now we go back to the analogy of you trying to walk through a crowded hallway. Well, if everyone is walking through at a nice, steady, orderly pace, it's not going to be that difficult for you to get from one side to the other. But if everybody's running around in a panic, then it's going to be very difficult for you to get from one side to the other. And so this increase in temperature causes an increase in the resistance. And the way that that's going to happen is up here somewhere we need to figure out what is the heat going to affect most. Is it the resistivity or is it the geometry? And yes, there is such a thing as thermal expansion in materials. Typically when things get hot they do expand. When they get cold they shrink. But when it comes to the resistance of our conductor, which of these three is really being affected the most by the increase in the temperature? And the answer to that is the internal kinetic energy of all the individual atoms. So it turns out that the temperature as the temperature goes up, it's actually causing the resistivity to go up, which then causes the resistance to increase. So what we want to do next is look at the relationship of resistivity to temperature. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to make ourselves a graph. So we're going to graph increase in temperature versus resistivity. Now our material, we can really start with any material that we want, but let's just say we've got copper. And our temperature scale, well, how low can our temperature scale go? Well, we can go all the way to absolute zero if we want. And in fact, that's what we're going to do. So our temperature is going to be on the Kelvin scale. And one nice thing about Kelvin is that the unit size on the Kelvin scale is the same as the unit on the Celsius scale. So if we change temperature by 20 degrees Celsius, then We've also changed our temperature by 20 Kelvin. And the difference between the two is that, uh, let's see here, 0 degrees Celsius would be approximately 270, I'm sorry, I've got that backwards, 0 Kelvin. would be approximately negative 274 Celsius. Okay. All right, well, so if we start down here at absolute zero, absolute zero is the theoretical temperature where all matter stops moving, so there shouldn't be any kinetic energy, which means technically, there should be no motion to the atoms inside of our conducting material. And if that were the case, if every one of these atoms was just completely frozen in place, 
it would be incredibly easy for our charged particle to make its way through the conductor. In other words, zero Kelvin would result in what we called superconductivity. And this is where our resistance will effectively be zero. But as we increase the temperature is when we start to see an increase in our resistivity value. And if you look at the, the graph that I've drawn here, it looks pretty linear, but I made a point of giving this just a, a slight bit of curvature. And that's because resistivity is not always completely linear for all materials. But we can actually get around that by choosing to make our temperature difference relatively small. So if I look at changing the temperature of my material from T1 to T2 and compare that to the spot on the graph where I have initial resistivity and final resistivity, then I can get away with saying that uh, this portion of the graph is pretty linear, so I'm going to treat this like a line. And in doing so, we can set up an expression to find the slope of the line. And as you remember back in uh, algebra, slope is rise over run, where rise is the change in the vertical, run is the change in the horizontal, so in this case we've got T2 and T1. And so what we have here is a change in our resistivity value as a result of a change in temperature. And I guess we could also write that as delta rho if we wanted to. And we're going to call this ratio alpha. And alpha is the temperature coefficient of the material. Now do remember that the resistivity of the material is unique to the material itself. As such, the temperature coefficient of the material is also going to be unique to the material itself. Now our slope expression says, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace two and one with final and initial, if you guys don't mind. So what we can do with this equation is we can, we can play around with how everything is laid out in this expression. And we can get a new expression that says that the new resistivity of our material will equal the initial plus any change in temperature as we consider the effects of the temperature coefficient itself. And so this equation is what will allow us to figure out how the resistivity of the material will change as the temperature changes. And I specifically left the temperature change as delta T because uh, we don't always have to have the temperature go up. We can have the temperature go down. And that means we can actually uh, end up with a resistivity that is lower than the initial.
Well, now that we have that equation, now that we know how resistivity will change based on changing temperature, how is that going to affect resistance? And we'd say, well, all we have to do is plug in the new resistivity value after we're done changing the temperature and we get our new resistance. And that's it. But there is one little side note that I want to consider and that is the idea of thermal expansion. What do we do if the material does in fact expand? What if you have something like a large uh, railroad strip? So you have a very, very long piece of conducting material and all of a sudden it gets very hot and it starts expanding upon its length and its width. So how does that thermal expansion affect the resistance of the material? And you'd probably say to yourself, well, I guess we need to know what the new dimensions of that material are. So here's how we're going to sort of skirt around that issue. I'm going to take our resistance expression and rearrange it for resistivity. So resistivity would be resistance times area over length. And I'm going to plug that in to our thermal expression here, or the, the temperature dependent expression for resistivity. So our resistivity equation, where I had final resistivity, will now say final resistance, final cross-sectional area, final length, equals initial resistivity times 1 plus alpha delta T. So down here we've got uh, resistance initial, area initial, length initial, 1 plus alpha delta T. And from here we would get the new resistance by multiplying by the reciprocal of our final geometry values. And here's where we're going to cheat a little bit. If we look at this multiplication, I have area over length times length over area. So at the very least, all of the units are going to cancel out. But if you have an object that is expanding in all directions because of an increase in temperature, then how does the ratio of those dimensions compare? And if the material expands at the same rate in all directions, then the ratio of the original geometry should be effectively the same as the ratio of the final geometry. In other words, the ratio of the uh, dimensions of our object those should be relatively equal even after the thermal expansion. And so everything that we have inside this boxed arrangement here is effectively going to come out to be 1, at least for our introductory purposes. And once that happens, well, we have an equation for the changing resistance 
that looks almost identical to the changing resistivity expression. So I'm going to go ahead and end the video there because the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start looking at circuit diagrams involving resistors which means that we need to start drawing circuit diagrams involving symbols for resistors and batteries etc and I think that that would be best suited for a separate video so please use this video uh, rewind double check use these ideas on your homework sets get back to me or Dr. Corey with any questions that you have or you can always contact your TA otherwise I'll see you at the next video.